Hello, hello. What's up, everybody? How are you all doing? You see me fine? Hear me loud and clear? Start the session. <laughs> I'm working on it. Uh, how are you all doing today? I'm a uh, owner. I'm gonna be your instructor again for this animation bootcamp. Mm. I am gonna do the same thing I did last time. I don't know if anyone was here last time, but uh, I'll take you through everything from like the very basics. So if you haven't done anything yet, I would recommend just downloading the Blender scene first of all. It is pinned as a comment and also in the description of the stream. And you can just do that while I'm sort of talking. Yeah, so today we're basically gonna do a one and a half hour session. And the goal is to get people familiar with Blender and with animation. So hopefully by the end of today, y'all will be able to export a little bouncing ball animation that we're going to be doing together. And um, I would be really, like, it would make me really happy if people took the opportunity to sort of interact in the chat. You know, that's why we're doing it live. So I can actually help y'all out and listen to you and chat with you all. Um, that's kind of what makes it so special compared to a video or something so if you're in the chat it would make me happy if you just wrote like hello or just let me know like where you're from or something or if you've ever tried blender before I'm wondering if there's anyone in the chat that has any experience or maybe all of you are completely new and either is completely fine as well and feel free to ask questions for sure like any and all questions are very welcome even if it's not about the animation specifically like if it's about uh, 3d in general or maybe the school here at Keda um, those are completely welcome as well you can just ask away okay so if you were ma able to get the uh, blender scene open just let me know in the chat and that would be nice to know to figure out if it's working for everybody and uh, if stuff goes too fast, just let me know as well and we can slow down or repeat stuff over and over again. I want everybody to sort of be able to catch up. I'm considering starting at Keda when I'm done with HDX in two years. However, I'm kind of nervous that it wouldn't be worth going at Keda because of AI. I mean, in two years, would AI be very powerful in 3D? Also, this is really cool. So. Basically, uh, okay, there's a lot of panic around AI and I totally get that, but I would say my outlook is more on the positive side and I'll tell you why. So there was a panic in the animation industry a while ago and that was when 3D animation started taking over 2D animation and people were like, oh, well, PCs can do everything now, we're going to be out of jobs and stuff and stuff. But in reality, it just kind of made the whole medium explode right like there's so much 3d animation now compared to back then when there's only 2d and like the new jungle book it had like a budget of 300 million dollars or something insane like that which is ins it's just so much compared to what the original 2d jungle book had uh, for an animation budget so in a sense stuff is gonna change but I also believe it's gonna grow the whole into in the uh, like industry of entertainment like as a whole, and that could potentially like explode job opportunities. Sure, this sort of pathways to get there might change, but I still think there's gonna be a lot of opportunity for people. That's my that's my take on it, and especially like if AI becomes really good, well then entertainment is gonna be very sort of sought after because people will have more time, right? They don't have to plow the fields or, you know, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. I hope that sort of uh, answered your question. That's my take on it. Like, of course, no one can see what the future holds, but even if AI becomes a crazy big part of the workflow, you'll have like the upper hand if you've already studied. Like, as, a, as an employer, would you hire someone with some experience or like with no experience? Of course you go with the person that has some experience. 
and the people that are going to have some experience in AI are the people that are already in the industry as it's changing, which is massive, right? Okay. HDX. I wonder if you you guys are doing any 3D at HDX already. I know you can take like programming and stuff like that as a side thing. But yeah, um, let me know if you're able to open the scene and we'll take it from there. I'll just go over like the very basics of what you see. And it might be a little overwhelming right now, but don't worry. I'll just go over everything very quick. It's important to remember that Blender is a like the Swiss knife of 3D, like you can do so many things here, but we'll only be using a very small amount of features, so don't be too scared that it might seem a little overwhelming at first, right? Okay, so I'll assume that people have been able to open up the scene, and I'll kind of go from here, so. What we see on the screen right now, the main part of it is uh, what we call the viewport, and this is basically where we select stuff and do all our things and see what's actually happening when we change stuff. And we have all these tabs up here. And these are, like I said, Swiss knife of 3D. There's a lot of things you can model. You can sculpt, you can do UVs, textures, and some of these things. Like I like to live up in some of these tabs, but today we're just gonna be doing animation. And uh, these are all just variations of the very base layout. You can get your base layout to look like anything you want, basically by dragging, you just left click and drag and stuff. And then you can sort of change things as well. Out here is what we call the outliner. And this is where we can select stuff in our scene. So our camera, we can select that. We can select the floor, we can select the ball and all these kind of things. We won't be using that for this one and a half hours. So don't worry about that. Right, and then here, we have all the more advanced functions of Blender. We won't really be going into that too, but you have like render settings and rigging stuff and physics and stuff like that in there. On the side here, you see I dragged it out. You can drag it in and out. So if it ever disappears, you just gotta drag it out on the little arrow. We have like all the stats of whatever it is that we have selected. So if I select my camera here, you can see there's like a location thing and we can drag and left clicking and dragging here where you can type in a number. So it just offsets it by two meters on the X. And we'll keep that at zero for now. And if you're messing around with the UI right now, totally feel free to. And if stuff really breaks, then you can just reopen the, uh, just close it down, don't save it and then reopen the scene. Uh, down here we have the time slider and I would like so if you have already used blender before but you're new to animation uh, just stay with me for a moment just stay with me for a moment because um, what you're gonna learn is like principles of animation so it'll be useful even if you, you have a little bit of experience in blender like the stuff I'll teach today will be useful always Blender versus 3ds Max, and this is kind of what we're gonna aim for today. Blender versus 3ds Max, which is better for beginners? Okay, so my philosophy is, as a student, the best software to use is the software where you can get the most information. So all the 3D software is like, once you know stuff in one software, you kind of understand stuff in another software, right? So if you're not going to a school or you don't have a mentor or something like that and you're just learning on your own, then I would definitely recommend uh, Blender, in my opinion, because there's just so much information out there on the internet. And then maybe if you have to work at a studio or go to a school or something, then you can probably switch if you have a teacher or have another source of information. If you find a course you really like that use Maya, for example, or 3ds Max, then I would go for that. But as a beginner, just go for whatever has the most information. Like the specifics of the software is not important for you right now. Sure. So yeah, even what I'm teaching you today in Blender, you can do the same thing in 3ds Max, no? Okay, so basically today we're gonna make the ball look like this little bouncing thing. This is what we did last time. And we're gonna try to do the same thing again. So to navigate around, you see me doing it already, cause I'm like, 
so used to it, I do it without thinking now, but you can rotate around the viewport by holding down middle mouse. This is how you'll begin navigating. So just do that. If you have the scene open, just do it, get familiar with it. The middle button on your mouse, you click that, you hold it, and then you can pan around, not pan around, uh, orbit around, you can rotate. And then if you wanna pan, you add a shift to that. So you hold down shift and then middle mouse on your uh, mouse cursor or your mouse. You just middle mouse, drag, and now you can pan around. And with these two, you can get very far. It's just the basics of navigation. And when you scroll on your little mouse wheel, you can zoom in and out. So middle mouse to rotate around, shift middle mouse to pan, and then scroll to zoom in and out. So all the people that are joining, um, I'm going over the very basics now. You can still follow along, just download the scene that's pinned as a comment somewhere. I don't know where that would be. Well, I pinned as a thing in the comment section or whatever, uh, or in the description, and then also I pinned it as a comment in the chat. There's a little we tra transfer link, and you just download that, and you boot it up, and you should be ready to go with me. Right? So get a little bit familiar with that. You left click to select stuff. Left click, boom, boom, boom. And you click I to insert keyframes. We'll get into that more. Down here is our timeline and we'll do all the animation there. So let me know if uh, anyone is following along at this point, if stuff is working and then I'll uh, kind of continue for there, but I'll just give people a second to sort of figure out the rotation and stuff. Ajay, did that answer your question? How do you feel about that answer? Do you want something more specific to, like you can you can ask, ask me more stuff and I'll give my opinion. I personally, I started out with Blender, back to Maya, back to Blender, and then back to Maya and so on and so forth. So I've been in a lot of different places. Right now, I'm mainly a Blender user, even at the school. Okay, we will start animating and stuff is gonna look kinda strange at first and that's okay and we'll fix all of it. I'll hold your hand. So first things first, we wanna animate this little, uh, this little bouncing animation. So it's just gonna be an up and down bounce. So the first thing we can do is if you drag this here, you can rotate around and if you click this little minus Y on the little ball, you can go into a side view and we can work from there. That'll be pretty nice. And I'll hide the camera out in our out outliner. I'll left click it and then hide it out here. You click the little eyeball icon and it hides it. Yeah. As to start animating, we got a select our rig which is basically the controllers we use to tell our ball what to do which is that this little thing here and then we can go into the pose mode because we want to start changing the way the ball is sort of posed like you can imagine a human pose it's like you can change the way your limbs the direction they go and everything and then here we'll change the way the ball is moving right so once we get into like how to move stuff around, you get, uh, you, you just like in Blender, you just have this default, you just select stuff, right? And it can be a little bit, um, You just left click stuff right and then if you want to move things around you have these uh, options out here so if we go back into pose mode up here where it says object mode you go into pose mode you can select stuff and then once you click this little gizmo here is what we call it you have move you have rotate you have scale for now we're just going to be using the move and it's very intuitive you just 
left click and drag the up arrow when you want something to go up. So we have these three uh, controllers on our ball. If we click the top one, we can just move the top up and down. The bottom one, we can move the bottom up and down. And then the very bottom one at the floor, we can move the whole ball up and down. So as you can imagine, we're gonna be starting off uh, by using that one. And if stuff is going too fast, do you have questions? Just let me know in the chat, right? So back to side view, we click this minus Y here. We go into something that's called an orthographic view. And now we need to um, sort of start our animation. So first things first, we can set the space in which we want to animate or the time. So down here is like basic start button, pause button, start, and you can see the timeline is moving here. So the little number that's up here is counting the frames. So we can start off by saying like we want it to be um, 30 frames long, let's say. Boom. And now once we play it, it's gonna go from zero to 30 frames. So 30 pictures in total, and it's just gonna repeat here. Okay, and then now what we have to do is set in our poses. So for a bouncing ball, we wanna have a pose at the bottom, at the top, and then at the bottom again. These are gonna be our key poses and you'll learn a little bit more about key poses in a second. So first things first, we set a keyframe on I and you can set a location keyframe in the beginning. And then you go up. So instead of using this one, I click G as well. You can do that, G for move. Click G to move it up, set another keyframe. If you're wondering why you can't move it to the side or whatever, it's because I locked it just to make it a bit easier on you all so you don't uh, accidentally mess something up. Okay. And then we want another down pose. So for the down pose, we can set over here, we can set the transforms to zero. And then I and set the location keyframe. Boom, boom, boom. Nice and simple. And now if we play it black, it like doesn't look like what we expect at all. And that has to do with, uh, well, how you make animation look good. And that's kind of the main thing about animation. You know, it's not just about learning the 3D software. It's about learning how animation work as like at the base fundamental level. And that's all about the principles of animation, right? So, yeah. Basically from here, like I could keep going on about stuff, but it's really important for me that you all actually kind of understand how animation work fundamentally. And for that, it's easier to show it from a video. And I'll show a really nice video from the Keda 3D Animation Essentials course. And you can read more about that on the Keda website as well. But I'll just show like a little sneak peek of one of the videos and it will go over the principles of, in, of animation. There's 12 of them, and if you master those, you can pretty much get any animation to look really, really good. So, everybody just buckle down and kind of listen to this video for a little bit, and once you hear what they have to say, you might understand kind of where we're supposed to go from from here. So I'll just enjoy this for a second, and I'll kind of get out of here. Before diving into Blender, it's important that we understand some terminology and concepts that are fundamental to animation. Animation is an art form that is over a century old. At its most basic, it is a sequence of still images that have been manipulated to create the illusion of life and to elicit ideas and emotions on an audience. There's many different ways to create animation. Pencil on paper, oil paint on glass, clay puppets, 3D images. The possibilities are endless. Animation can encompass any and all visual styles. And while there's no rules to animation, usually we're trying to establish a relationship between us and the audience. And in order to do so, we need to create animation that can feel relatable. 
The process of animation can depend a lot on the technique that we use. In our case, we will be doing 3D computer animation. The workflow has been greatly influenced by classical hand-drawn 2D animation and stop motion, wherein, starting from an idea or an emotion, whether it is for a small scene or an entire movie, a series of images are created to communicate that concept. We usually identify key moments in time, and from there we continue to create images to fill all that time and space in between. To help create those key images and to create the illusion of life in the screen, animators have traditionally used 12 principles to great effect to create appealing and believable animation. So let's take a look. Squash and stretch. This is perhaps the easiest principle to distinguish. All objects and matter have a degree of weight, volume, and flexibility. Rigid objects tend to deform little, while objects that are softer and with more plasticity tend to deform more. Through squash and stretch, we can illustrate actions, reactions, perspective, and forces applied to a particular object. Anticipation. Anticipation prepares the audience for an action that is about to be performed. Each major action is preceded by a movement that is usually to the opposite direction of what is about to happen. Staging. Staging is the presentation of an idea so that it is clear. Staging uses elements like the posing of a character, the composition of a shot, and other abstract elements to communicate a concept or emotion to the audience, always with clarity in mind. Straight ahead and post pose. This principle mostly refers to hand-drawn animation and a specific way of working in order to create it. Straight ahead animation means that one works by drawing or posing the animation from start to finish, frame by frame while pose to pose functions by establishing certain keyframes that function as landmarks or targets, leaving space in the middle for in-betweens to be done at a later time. Follow through and overlapping action. Not all things move at the same time. Some initiate movement while others drag behind. And in characters, not all things stop at the same time either. So when the main body stops, all other parts continue to move until they lose all momentum and catch up to the main mass. Things like animal tails, clothes, hair, or limbs can help create more believability by delaying or offsetting their movement from the main mass of the character, and consequently how they settle into a still position. Slow in and slow out. Following the laws of physics, characters and objects need time to accelerate and to slow down. So more pictures are drawn near the beginning and the end of an action or a change of direction. Fewer drawings in between makes the action faster, while more drawings make the action slower. Arcs. In characters and creatures, rarely do we move in a straight line. Usually, our bodies move in arcs or slightly circular trajectories, giving a more organic and natural feeling. Straight movement is usually reserved for actions that need to come across as mechanical and stiff. Secondary action. It's an additional action in the scene that complements and reinforces the main action and acting choices of the scene. Timing. This principle refers to the number of frames for a given action, which translates to the speed of the action. Correct timing makes objects appear to obey the laws of physics. Timing can help us understand the weight and impetus of an object or character, as well as the level of reality depicted through the animation. Pushed or stylized timing can alter the reality of a character and their personality. Exaggeration Perfect imitations of realistic movements can often seem static or dull. Exaggerating or pushing an action can help emphasize it and create clarity and a stronger emotional reaction in our audience. Depending on our style of animation, the degree of exaggeration can help establish the narrative and the tone of our story. Solid drawings. While also most applicable for 2D animations, solid drawings can be understood for 3D animation as creating good balance poses for our characters that have clear lines of action, sense of volume, and a sense of consistency for the character. Appeal. It refers to creating a sense of charm and pleasing the viewer's eyes through action. Not that everything needs to be cute, but it does need to be satisfying. An important thing to mention is that you don't have to use the extreme form of these principles all the time. Think of them like ingredients to cook a delicious meal. Sometimes we will be using some more than others. Very cartoony animation might use a lot of stretch and squash and a lot of exaggeration, while maybe realistic animation will opt to do something much more subtle with very little contrast. It really depends on what it is that we're animating that we will use those principles for. If you want to learn more about these principles, and I really encourage you to, I recommend two books to continue your research. The first one is The Illusion of Life by Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, and the second one is The Animator's Survival Kit by Richard Williams. 
A lot of these principles will become much, much clearer once we start animating. It's a good idea to revisit them and research more about them once in a while. In the next video, I will be making a brief introduction to Blender. We'll take a look around and we will be making our very first animation. See you then. Fix everything again. Okay. There we go. So, just one more time. That was from the Keda 3D Animation Essentials course. And if you want to learn more uh, about that stuff and you want more educational content like that, you can read more about it on the Keda website. All right. So that was a lot. And believe it or not, all of the stuff you see there, it all starts with a bouncing ball. It really does. Best system of Blender. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean, Blender is a great system, yeah. And that all starts with a bouncing ball. And it, it really did for me too. Like, I also started with a bouncing ball. And hopefully today I can take you all through how to do a great bouncing ball. And the bouncing ball is so great for this because you get to use all those principles on like a very simple object and you can make it like come to life in whatever way you want and that's kind of what's so amazing about animation you can take anything and make it come to life through movement which is so fantastic so in order i don't expect people to remember all of them already but we'll go through them one by one we'll add timing to the ball we'll add spacing anticipation squash and stretch and then follow through and i might, might sound a lot uh, like a lot right now but we'll go through them one by one and it will really make this ball come to life because right now it doesn't look that lively if you compare to this which is very lively okay so the spacing first of all the spacing is like in traditional animation you gotta imagine like you sort of had to draw every single like frame because you're basically flipping paper right, right? which is like so crazy uh, you take so much time to make movies back then but you're just drawing every single frame that the object is on screen for so spacing is kind of like how far away do you move something every time you draw it if you remove it a lot every time you draw it well, that means that thing is going to move more for each frame, which makes it look like it's going faster. And if we look at how is a traditionally spaced bouncing ball done, it kind of looks something like this, where at the very top, you have a lot of drawings. And as the ball speeds up, going down towards the ground, you draw it further and further apart until it hits the ground. And then boom, all the energy boom gets released. And you draw it further apart again and then at the top it's close because it's kind of slowing down right and we want to do the same thing in 3d more or less and that's why it's so great that you can learn stuff in 3d but you can even use it for like 2d motion graphics anything at all because these are just basic principles of how stuff works so if we look closely at what's happening to our ball it might be hard to see especially on the stream and stuff but the spacing is completely off like as it gets towards the ground it's slowing down which is not what we want at all that's not correct and basically all of this is happening because what we set our key poses inside blender our key frames and then everything that happens between if we go here we can jump between the key frames you can also press up and down on your keyboard the arrow keys up and down and you can cycle through all these uh, frames we set it's just guessing basically it's guessing what to do between these because we didn't tell it anything then it has to be down it has to be up and then it has to be down like blender doesn't know that there's gravity or bounciness or anything that's where we kind of write the story and to demonstrate how blender guesses because it's kind of important to know that I set up a little demonstration scene to make it very visual because I am a visual learner myself and that makes it easy for me and it might look a little bit daunting at first
but bear with me for this one everybody so it might look really complicated but actually I just recreated our bouncing ball that we have inside the scene and there's this very nifty tool in 3d where you can actually see the spacing even though you didn't draw in every single frame of the ball so if you look if we go forward in the frames frame one two three you can see it down here you see that it's actually not moving very much for each frame that we go forward and then it's not moving very much in the beginning but at the middle it starts moving a lot more and then at the top it slows down which kind of gives this weird feeling it doesn't feel correct to us and that's what animation is all about you really feel stuff even if you don't necessarily see it right away you really feel it and if we look at this well, yeah, we kind of getting it right, where at the top we want it to be slow, but the problem is at the bottom, we want it to be fast, both on the way down and on the way up. And that is not what's happening at all. And how do we correct that in 3D? How do we make Blender sort of guess the right way of doing things? And we do that with something called the Graph Editor, which is complicated at first, but once you get used to it, it will really save you a lot of time and it's actually kind of fun because you can change the look of stuff very fast and I'll show you how to do that. So basically what a graph is, it's kind of like a, any old coordinate system that you might know from math class or whatever, but it's not very mathy. just bear with it for a second. So basically you're telling this line is where the ball is how high up it is this blue line is like the position the z position of the ball so at the bottom is where we set our one keyframe at the top is the second keyframe so all it has is this information we want it to be down and then we want it to be up and then it guesses everything here in between this is our graph so if we kind of look at it like this you can imagine it goes one forward and then not very far up on the graph one more forward and then a little bit more up but still not that much and then it keeps doing that and you can kind of see here you see how every frame it goes forward and moves a little bit up and then in the middle is actually where it moves the fastest it goes up a lot for each frame and we don't want that that's not what we want so how can we change it well, I changed it in a very basic way here on another bouncing ball. And I did this with basically like two different changes and it already looks so much better. So if we play this, boom. Yeah, it doesn't look perfect yet, of course, because this is only one principle that we're using. But you already see that it feels a lot more bouncy. And it feels like it's actually falling towards the ground and being like shot up in the air. And if any of this is confusing guys, just let me know in the chat and I'll go over stuff again or if you have questions, feel free to ask them for sure. I would love for people to interact with the chat. And for all the people that are new, you can still follow along if you download the uh, Blender file. But so if you look here, look closely, what's happening is actually very different than the graph. When we move one forward, we actually go very far up in the graph already. Oh, little hearts, I see that. Heart back at you. Thank you. But yeah, let me get some water. But you can kind of look at this graph and try to understand what's happening. It can be intuitive, but it can also take a little bit of playing around with it before you really understand it. So if you're not fully understanding it at this point, don't worry. It will definitely come with a little bit of practice, right? So yeah. It moves a lot in the beginning and then as we go forward in the frames we see that it actually starts going up less and less and it gives us this movement where it moves very fast in the beginning and then slows down and then poof, accelerate or like gravity takes over and then basically pushes down into the ground again and that's the movement that we want so if we understand this, we can basically do whatever we want with animation. We can time it however we want and get whatever we 
like feeling we want out of our objects, sort of. So if we both go back to our main scene, we can see that our spacing here, we kind of ended up with this, which is not what we wanted. And we can change it. So first things first, we can go into the animation tab up here and set that as our active, like working area, sort of. And it's split up in a way that's very nice to work in when you wanna mess with the graph editor. So I click this little Y button here, and then scroll to zoom in and out, play it on spacebar, and we have this here. So up here, you can change what you see in this little viewport here. And we wanna change that to the graph editor. So you go right here and you pick graph editor. Are people with me so far? Do you all need to set the keyframes again or is it okay for me to continue? I would really love for people to be able to follow along. But I know it can be very daunting and confusing if you're very new to Blender and things might be moving fast. But that's also okay, so just let me know if that's happening to you. But you can also zoom in and out here uh, by using the scroll wheel. You can sort of drag on these little dots down here to extend your view. But you'll notice that we see the exact same thing that we did in the other scene where our ball is moving very slowly in the beginning and then it starts moving faster and faster and then slow in the top too. And if anything out of this whole like one and a half hour session, if this sort of starts to make sense to you by like, the end of it, that would be fantastic. Like that's already great knowledge to have because you can use it for any animation related work in the future. Okay, the question is, how do we change this? Well, our little keyframes down here, they all have a handle. So the keyframe is in the middle and then you have two handles here you can change. So to select them, I just left click and drag. What's up, Ankit? Hello again. I remember you from last time. You doing all right? I saw all the cool stuff you posted. I'm good, thank you, thank you. But yeah, so basically what you do, if you open this little window, we can start out by hiding our X and our Y location, because we just want to work on the up and down movement for now. So you can select a little handle here, and now something really cool is gonna happen. You just click G, G for grab, and you can grab it. And then you can move it around and we can sort of try to get what it is we saw in the other scene so we want it to actually go up a lot in the beginning and as we hit the middle the highest point we want it to go slower and we do that on both sides now and then we play it and we see how that feels a lot better already which is amazing considering that we just moved two little handles right that's what's so amazing about computer animation, whether it's 3D or 2D computer animation, you can make the computer do all the in-betweening for you. Not all of it, but you know, some of it. Because hmm? in traditional, you would have to go back in and draw all of these balls, but we don't have to do that. Great, so I will put this in the middle as well. So I'll call that done for the uh, timing right now. Um, Sorry, the spacing. The timing is what I just adjusted. Like when it's at the highest, when it's at the lowest. And the spacing is like, you know, how far apart you put it on each, um, each little frame. So move it a lot in the beginning and not a lot at the top. That's the spacing, right? So when we play this, it's kind of fine, but it's also a bit boring. It doesn't really feel like there's a lot of life to it. And the ball just sort of like, boom, like explodes up in the air and it doesn't really feel right. So what we have to do is what's called anticipation. We have to sort of make the action make sense, both to the viewer and like in a physical sense. So if I wanna punch, you know, not that I would wanna punch you, don't worry, but basically I don't just go like that. I pull back my arm first and then go like that. So you can kind of predict that I'm about to move my arm forward. 
and the same thing happens with the bone. So what I did is we want to add something in front of our animation. So I went down here to our frame count and set it to 40. Are you uh, doing all right, by the way, Anke? Do you want to follow along too? I could sort of give you a second to catch up if you need it. But... So I set it to 40 for now, and I left click and drag on all our keyframes and I move them up. So I would just guess right now that we need about five frames. So five frames to do some kind of anticipation. And what kind of anticipation can we do with the ball? Well, we have these nice little controllers here that can move the ball up and down, which is really cool. And if you ever get lost in the scene, people, you can click view and you can click um, uh, frame all if you ever get lost. View and then frame all. You can also click the home key on your keyboard and it'll take you right back. But this little ball up here, we can sort of squish it down to do the anticipation, almost like a spring, if you imagine that. You squish it down before it goes up. So let's do that and see how that works. So we go back into our orthographic view. So I select the main controller first, because I want to see where we have our keyframes. So I can click the little pin button down here. You click that, and now when you select the other controller, you can still see where our keyframes are. So just like with the main controller, we click I, insert location, and then here we want to squash the ball. So we use squash and stretch for the anticipation too. And we squash it down and then we set another keyframe for the location. And now before the ball starts moving up, it squashes down. That looks really weird, right? Because the spring doesn't compress and then just go up. It compresses and then springs up. Which is what we do with squash and stretch, right? We can make it springy with squash and, squash and stretch. So, okay, how do we think about this? At the top, we can set the location of the little controller to zero. Because at the top, we'll have it sort of be a neutral pose. And we can look at how people do with uh, traditionally animated stuff too, right? So with the squash and stretch, you can really sell the movement of, of something. Like if something is flying really fast, you can sort of imagine it being squashed from the speed. Or if it's falling really fast, if it's hitting something really hard, it would squish down. You can basically imagine it as like a spring, right? So if we do this, well, we get to this point where it squishes down and then goes but it doesn't quite look right because if we just think about what I said when something goes really fast it kind of gets like pulled apart stretched out or like sprung out if you imagine a spring squishes and then it pushes all that power we have to show it so how do we show that well the fastest point as we learned with the graphs is right after it leaves the ground so surely right after it leaves the ground is where it must be pushed the most outwards. So we can really get that nice contrast in there. So squish down and then boom. You already see how much more interesting it starts to look. And that's a thing, not just an animation, but like art in general. You want to push those contrasts as much as you can. Like now that I have the most squished and the most pushed right between, like right after each other, you get like a really interesting sort of visual. And that's not just for animation, that's for everything. Whatever you want to show with art, you can show it through contrast pretty much. Mm. If we wanted this to have a really funny feeling, we could squash it down super far and then have it like, completely normal on the next frame and that would kind of be like burp, and then it like barely leaves the air right that would also be funny but that's also play on contrast but right here we just want like a fast moving bouncing ball kind of give that feeling of speed and then nothing happens at the end so of course we want to fix that right so if we look at this well it goes fast when it leaves the air 
but it also goes fast when it's about to touch the ground because of the gravity. So we can push that feeling too. As it's getting close to the ground, we really want to stretch it out again. So let's try that. Let's see what that looks like. Boom. Okay, fine. And then once it hits the ground, we want to squash it like a spring coming down. Get squashed out to sell that feeling of actual like mass and sort of weight. And now we look. Boom. Okay, it looks a little bit strange. I'm going to kind of think about why that actually looks strange. Hmm. Just from experience, I feel it feels like the ball is almost teleporting, doesn't it, right? You gotta feel, you gotta play, like click space by a bunch, drag this little thing around and feel it. It feels like it's almost teleporting to me. And we can think about the reason why. Well, it's because the ball is actually never touching the ground before it squashes down. So maybe we should push the down pose so we can go here and we can sort of drag our little points around. So this is the control for the squash and stretch down here. And I'll drag or up like our very pushed pose to the pose where it touches the ground. And then actually on the next one is where it flattens out. So it touches and then flattens out, which might give a better feeling. And that already feels better. It goes flat, which is great. And it feels a lot more alive already. It's fantastic. But then, um, of course, we have this issue in the end where we sort of end up in this situation where well, it looks very strange. It just hits and well, nothing happens at all, right? Like, it doesn't feel super bouncy. So we add follow through. And follow through is basically when you have a movement and stuff has mass and volume and weight, I can't just move my hand and just like stop it instantly. If it has a lot of weight, well, it will go a little bit like that, if that makes sense. And the same with a spring, when it goes down, it'll go. It kinda, you know, it kinda, all that energy, it has to go somewhere. So it'll be a little bit springy. And how springy you make it is like, just depends on the feeling you want out of whatever object you, you are animating. You could have it be not springy at all and have it like be solid bouncy if you want it to feel like a rock or something but for this we want just like a nice and bouncy ball so at the end of our animation we want it to come up in the air again and once we play it that already feels kind of great doesn't it i think it feels kind of good and there's a lot of stuff to improve here so spring analogy again, when something hits the ground, even if it's a spring, hits the ground, it kind of goes up and then down. It kind of has to settle a little bit. So in between our down and then our neutral here, we put another keyframe, I set location, and we set it a little bit too high. I set location every time you change something, and then kind of get that nice little bounce in there which should feel pretty neat. I hope people can follow along to this point. If there's any questions again, like uh, feel free to ask questions, even if it's just related to 3D in general and not specifically about animation. Like I'm personally a big fan of like sculpting and modeling and texturing and that kind of stuff. So feel free to ask questions about that or about the school, or if you have any questions about Blender or the industry or something, feel free to ask. We're doing this live so everybody has an opportunity to ask the questions that they want to ask. I hope all of you are having a nice day as well. Boop. So now we have a fantastic great cycling animation. And um, here comes the thing like you can polish this as much as you want right. And sort of get whatever result out of it that you want whatever feeling you want. And I'll uh, keep doing that. 
and uh, you know something we did with this wall here is kind of like make it feel a little bit human in a sense like uh, of course it's not realistic this is stylized kind of made it feel like it's almost like pressing itself down before it jumps kind of like imagine a human being squatting down before they jump up into the air like that anticipation and jump so you have this little stylized ball here but I also feel that when humans jump really far, they some people might have a tendency to kind of tuck their legs up as they reach the apex, kind of like jump up and then tuck their legs and then down again. So we can kind of do something similar with this ball to kind of make it feel a little bit more fun. So at the apex, I wanted to basically tuck its little ball legs in. Even that, I guess it sounds like a really weird analogy, but it might kind of make sense in a second. So I'm setting a keyframe on either side of the extreme. And then in the middle, I want to move one up a little bit, not too much, because we don't want it to be too extreme. And we can sort of tug the legs of the little ball in. And we can end up in this little situation. And to me, this just looks so fun, right? Like a little ball that actually feels like it's jumping a little bit. I would love for people to be able to get to this point. I think if you can get to this point after um, watching the VOD of the stream, if you're doing that or watching it live, that would be fantastic for like your first hour of um, getting into animation. Because really animation is all about doing this, right? Using the principles to get the feeling you want. And you can do that even with a bouncing ball. Are people um, learning stuff in the chat? Has this been useful in any way? Is there stuff that's confusing to anyone at this point? Because I have a lot of time to sort of play around with this uh, more and uh, I could sort of go over stuff that people would like me to go over if there's anything like that. It could be general uh, Blender stuff too. But at this point, like if people would like to export this already we can sort of do that and i'll uh, show how to how do you export stuff in blender so in our outliner we hit our camera and we can unhide it so this is where we will be recording stuff from from if that makes sense so we can go on our view here we go to camera we can put our view to become um our active camera so we click active camera and then that is where we'll see everything from and I set up the scenes so it'll be really easy to export whatever you want so to export this all we got to do is go into the output and then it, all the settings should be set up for you all you got to do is click down here in output click this little folder here and then you pick wherever it is that you want to export to. So I want to export into bootcamp, documents, animation, and then animation video, whatever. Click accept. And then all you do is you click view and then viewport render animation. And if you want it to look a little nicer, you can click this little button up here, which hides all the overlays. So all the rig and stuff like that. And then all you do is click view and then viewport render animation and then you get this little thing so we can go in and check it actually animation video and then this is our little mp4 file and we can even cycle it if we want to set the cycle button yeah there we go and we have a great little looping Ball. and this should be a really fun thing to watch like make like something just a ball you kind of made come alive by animating it and it's sort of this thing in animation where you can do so much with so little if you ever seen like pixar how they have their little lamp and it feels so alive because they make it jump around in really funny ways if you guys know what i'm talking about if you've seen any Pixar movies, they kind of have that little lamp in the beginning of their show. 
Okay. See, as there is not a lot of questions or anything, I can just sort of keep going and make more interesting variations of this job. Have you been doing any new 3D Ankit? I kind of enjoyed seeing your stuff in the Discord. And since we have a lot of time, people, um, something I would recommend no matter where you're at in your 3D journey is like, it's so helpful to find community. And I can't stress this enough. Like, once you find people that are interested in the same stuff as you are, your improvement will just skyrocket, right? Because you can kind of do that together with people and that's really fun. So I would recommend, um, if you have the opportunity, you should go um, join the uh, CADA, like Discord server. Um, and I can link it again, it should be in the description. So let me find that for everybody. But once you join that, you can also post the art that you made yourself, even if it's not animation related. You can post that and I can kind of critique it if you want me to, or I can just look at it. Um, so if you go into the description of our stream here, uh, you should be able to actually see the link to our uh, Discord channel. And I, got, I can also find it real quick and post it in the... Uh, chat for everybody so there we go and then here it is and i would recommend if you have no community at all you you will really like i think you'll have a lot of fun to kind of join and uh, chat with people even if it's not just the kata discord server but it is a great place for that you can join any sort of 3d related discord server and uh, talk to people about the stuff that you're making it's really like important i think So I'll log in there and if people have made something new, I don't know if you're still there Ankit, but if you made something new, feel free to put it in there and then I can take a look at it if you want me to do that for you. Okay. Sorry everybody, I gotta do two factor authentication. I'll keep it open and then I'll keep working on this bouncing ball and making more interesting stuff in a second. But if you have stuff, you can just post it in like 3D bootcamp or a creative show off or anywhere and I'll have a look at that stuff. Okay, since we have extra time, um, I will make this bouncing ball do a sideways jump and we kind of did that last time too. So if we want to add more stuff here, we can extend our animation down here. Oh shit, am I blocking this part? Wait. I do apologize if I was blocking this. You should be able to see here. We can just extend our animation to like 70 or let's just do 80 and we can kind of make it twice as long. And then from here, well, I want to do an up and down again, so um, we can kind of go over the stuff one more time, basically. So we want to leave a little bit of space for some anticipation. So we can start it from here. We just set a base location and then around in the middle, we set our up pose. And then at the end, we set our down pose, so we just put it to zero here. Boom, 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 and now we play it. Oh, and that looks very strange. And so, what's going on? Well, it's all the stuff in between where Blender gets confused, right? Because it's just kind of guessing. So to, stop the, to fix the stuff in between, we go into our graph editor, which is like the friend of in between. So 
and to fix this kind of stuff. But we can't just move this because it kind of moves the stuff on the other side and we don't want that really. So if we click V, we can change it to free or we can change it to vector. So in this case we want to do free. And that means we can move both sides independently of each other. So I can just sort of flatten this out and see what that looks like. So now it hits the ground and then it goes up again, which is what we want. Great. And now we do the same thing if you remember. So again here it's not working because well, this side is going down, we don't want that. So we can left, uh, left click on it, click V and then set it to free. Now we can move them independently of each other and just make this flat. And then we set our spacing here by making the beginning really go up fast and then the end sort of go down fast again. So now we have a jump. And this whole jump, honestly, looking at it now, like it feels a little bit slow. But that's okay, you know. It is supposed to be our first jump after all. So something I like to do to make it a little bit more fun is you can select the first or like the top keyframe and you can click S to scale and just scale it out a bit. And if you can sort of imagine what that does is it's actually like changes the spacing so it holds at the top a little longer. And that can be a fun thing to do. So we're going to do the same over here. So now it actually just holds at the top a little bit longer. So this is before and then this is after. It just kind of can make a movement a little bit more snappy in a sense. You can hold it at the top. Basically what that's going to do is it's going to be very slow at the top and then whoosh, go fast down or jump fast up and then fast down. Right? Make it a little snappy. Okay, great. We do that on both sides. Just click G and S. G to move stuff, S to scale stuff. And now we can work on the squash and stretch again. So we can squash down the ball in the beginning. So the anticipation, if everybody remembers, we anticipate this movement, we squash it down, boom. Set the location. then at the very beginning well that's where it's fastest so we gotta push it up set the location i set a keyframe boom and then at the top we want it to be neutral if you remember we can look here so at the top we want it to be neutral because it's not moving very fast so we don't want to sort of introduce any like it's exaggerated movement basically right and now boom, it goes from very stretched to not that stretched and then at the end it hits the ground and then we want to add a little bit more set up to 90 um, our frame count and then at the end we can add some squash so So stretch as it's accelerating towards the ground, just as it hits, that's like when it has the most speed. So we wanna put the most stretch on that. And then right after it hits the ground, that's like all the force goes into the ball and squashes it flat. That's kinda of what we wanna do. Boop. And then we want the follow through. So like a spring brain, we want that energy to go somewhere. So at the end, we want it to be at a neutral position, but also we want it to sort of spring. We want it to sh we want to show all the energy. So we go above neutral position. There we go. And now we basically made the whole uh, jump one more time. Now we can see it looks sort of strange because we changed the spacing of our jump, but not really the spacing of our um, 
Squash and stretch. So we can do that. It's not really super necessary for um, your first bouncing ball, right? This is all about perfection and stuff like that. So we can see, well, it's holding right here, but our, um, these things, they're not holding. So this is the Z location for our squash and stretch controller. We can click these and sort of drag them out to match the movement. So as it's falling, we want those to change really quickly. Or to make this easier on ourselves, we just hide the other ones and only show this. And we can scale it out at the middle too, to make that also more snappy. And then once we play it, yeah, this should help a lot. Same with this one. Still holds it for not too long. So we can go like this and like that. So it does look a little bit like slow motion, and that's all to do with like our spacing. And this might be like difficult to fix if you're very new to animation, but if you follow along here, basically all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this is our down pose, and I'm just gonna left click and drag all the keyframes, and then move them in a little bit. And you don't have to do this, but this is just for my own sake because I want it to feel a little better spaced. Okay, and now it's not allowing us to. Control Z to undo stuff if you ever end up in that situation. We can shift click to select multiple things. And I'm just gonna move all of these back. So at this point, I'm just animating, uh, and you guys can watch me work or whatever. Oh, I gotta select the whole rig. Uh, yeah, I'll just keep animating and if there's any questions about the stuff that we've gone over or any questions at all Just let me know and I can sort of go over them So that feels better in the first half Maybe a bit too slow or whatever. That's fine. Just change the spacing here That looks kind of crazy, but it's also sort of fun. It almost feels like it's being sucked into the ground, right? That could be fun, but maybe not for what we're doing. So basically, we just need to sort of accelerate this movement a little bit less. And with animation, it's always easier to like pull back the ex exaggeration than add it. So we look at this squash and stretch controller, and we just gotta like you know, make it chill out a little bit. kind of go from here so now we made two jumps and they all feel they both feel a little bit different but I tried to make them kind of similar and if we want to now we can make it move sideways which will be kind of cool so I go in here and I unlock the um, the x-axis because now I want to do something crazy want to move it on the x-axis so we can see where does it jump, well right here. So we can set in a keyframe for the X, we already have that, right? And then we want it to move forward all the way until it touches the ground again. And we can just left click and drag here and move it. So let's just say five meters, okay, fine. I insert the keyframe and now we have a very strange jump because Blender doesn't understand, right? In the middle, so if we go to a graph editor, in the middle we have a keyframe that's just like on the ground too because we set it before. So we're supposed to go from here to here and keep moving the whole time, but we have this keyframe in the middle. 
so we can just go here and delete only on our x location we can go ahead and delete that and now we have like a forward movement and this is looking really strange again and this is all about spacing too but in the other way well a ball moving forward in the air it will just keep moving there's gonna be like no nothing pushing it or something so as soon as it leaves the ground we want it to go at the same speed all the time until it hits the ground of course there's like air drag and stuff but we're not gonna worry about that in this case so we can select this handle and make it a vector handle and this one and make it a vector handle too and now we just have this like linear movement <laughs> and now we have a bit of a forward jump which is fine it doesn't look great or anything it just looks kind of funny and of course because we want to follow those like arcs of animation so right here we don't want to jump straight up we want it to sort of so we can unlock the x here i want it to sort of jump in the direction and we want to even anticipate in the direction that we want to jump here so see i forgot to click i and insert my keyframes so i set the location and then insert this as well i insert location now we have boom. and then as it comes towards the ground we want it to move in that arc as well so right here we wanted to kind of if you imagine sort of oh shit i forgot to turn on my cam i'm sorry buddy i'm back um yeah so if you want imagine like we kind of follow that arc so the back of it is going to be a little bit delayed sort of so we want to show that arc even in the squash and stretch as it hits the ground we want the back to be sort of pushed this way Boom. and now it kind of feels a little nicer i'm still not sort of loving the way it's squashing it sort of still feels like it's being pushed towards the ground i mean it looks really fun maybe we'll tone it down a little bit maybe we're actually exaggerating a little bit too much because it doesn't feel that fast so we can tone it down like this too great now we have a just straight up and down jump and then also a sideways jump i don't expect anyone to be able to do the sideways jump just after one and a half hours here of like practicing but if you can do the first jump that would be fantastic to learn something at least from this we can actually look here because uh, Anklet posted like two days ago he posted his little uh, show job which is kind of cool it's all about community people so if you have stuff like this to post i would really recommend posting it somewhere Post it on the Kala Discord too, and you might be able to get some really nice feedback. There's some really cool stuff. I really sort of like how well the colors blend in here on this shot. That's pretty cool. looks like it could maybe benefit from like a weighted normal modifier or just maybe more subdivisions pretty cool pretty cool there's no zbrush i like that but we have really cool stuff I think overall I'd say main advice is you can definitely work on some lighting setups for these things like work on the lighting setup a bit more because really lighting it can really push something to look really nice 
course there's many things to work on, but that's probably one of the main things I would recommend. Yeah, keep going, it looks great. This one's beautiful. Looks like Unreal, perhaps, maybe? I'm not sure. Okay. Has people been enjoying? Has anyone learned something? I think if, um, yeah, if people are sort of like uh, done with this and um, I hope everybody could, uh, could learn something, I'll show how to export your animation one more time because people might want to do that at this point. So um, the way I set it up is really simple. You go into your output tab here and then you can click this folder and you can pick wherever you want your animation to be stored. So I'll just pick the same folder again and then I click accept. Now I can hide my UI on this little button here, unhide it again to make stuff look nice. And I can basically, if I don't want to use the camera, if you want to use my camera you can click view and then camera and then active camera. Then you can sort of record in this little box. Or you can just pick anywhere you want, really. So I'll play it like this. And this is kind of... Maybe this looks fine. And then I click... View. And then viewport for render animation. Let's see what that's going to look like. So I can already see it. Like I probably need to zoom in a little bit more. And then view. Viewport render animation. Then we can go and find that. And we have this. Boop. Boop. And we did it, everybody. We made a bouncing ball. And we even made two jumps for it, which is fantastic. I think if anyone is able to get to this point after watching this, they should be very happy. This is a lot, especially for a beginner, right? You're learning a software and you're learning how to animate at the same time. And um, it might be, especially if you're newer, like it might be intuitive to think that learning a software is basically the same as learning how to animate, but it's really not. Like it's two different things, learning how to animate and learning the software. Learning how to animate can be taught even outside of 3D on pen and paper too. So if there's no more questions, I'll uh, leave you guys. And I hope, if anything, that you understand a little bit more about animation. That's kind of all I wanted to do. And uh, we'll continue this class again in two days. On first day, I'll do another one and a half hour session. So today was basically session one. And then in two days, I'll do session two. And we'll bring a little bit more life into these balls and sort of figure out how to control them basically so how do you since right now we made a kind of generic bouncing ball and we just sort of did whatever to make it look good but uh, next time we'll go over how to make like a bowling ball for example or a ping pong ball or something how do we actually get that how do we breathe the type of life into the ball that we want to breathe into it? how do we get that control and that'll be in two days uh, on first day one and a half hours as well yeah, so I hope everybody enjoyed and I'll uh, leave you all and I hope you have a good evening from here on out and I'll see you in two days. So goodbye.